Hi guys, James just held up a sign requesting to record. Thank you, Sarah. I will do that right now. Here you go, James. All right. Sarah, can you speak again just to make sure we can hear you? Yeah. Oh. Um, is Lee? I didn't see Lisa in the participants yet. Is she? Lisa is here. Okay. Okay, there she is. I see her now. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I just wanted to make sure I was off the hook, Lisa. <laughs> totally get it. <laughs> All right, let's try again. It's like it's linked again. Okay. Last time it, it was like a full one. Yes. All right, we're just going to try to get the YouTube thing. Should we? better mm -hmm. all right great all right we are streaming and i think everyone can hear us so i will call the meeting to order at 704 we'll start right off with commendations and i will turn the floor over to principal sean satterfield and he is going to give us some good things that are going on at the alvillas and coffin schools welcome sean Thank you, Sarah. Thanks everyone for the opportunity to speak tonight. I just want to go through quickly some uh, wonderful things that have been happening at Coffin and Neville through this uh, kind of most challenging school year. As you know, we've been in our hybrid models since the third week in September. Though the first few weeks of our dust most definitely were a challenge, all of our staff and students have progressed pretty well through this fall. First, I would like to thank all of our teachers for their hard work in planning and implementing both in-person and remote lessons for all of our students. I've seen evidence of excellent collaboration between teachers, working to each other's strengths in the classroom and helping each other master the online skills and tools which are now necessary for the success in our classrooms. Our remote teachers have been great resources in this role. As I witnessed sitting in some of the online lessons, the things that the remote teachers are capable of doing remotely is nothing short of amazing. Nine months ago, none of us had any of these online skills. Now many of us do, and we're teaching others. With our in-school hybrid program, our focus has been on intense language arts and mathematics instruction. And as a result, our teachers have been able to keep up with our curriculum timelines to a great extent. Our special needs teachers have been able to continue a high rate of instruction, often by seeing some of our students on a daily basis. We continue to refine our instruction to meet the curriculum and student challenges as they arise. Another one of our challenges this year has been to work out how to create a sense of shared culture across classrooms, grade levels, and buildings. In previous years, we used our PBIS program to create whole school community meetings and classroom morning meetings. However, this year, that posed a challenge. How do we continue to engage the whole school community, which is spread across classrooms, buildings, and homes throughout the town? Our specialist, Danielle McGrath, who teaches PE, Eileen Demore, who teaches music, and our school counselor, Allison Eaton, have developed a weekly virtual community meeting where students from home log in and the in-person classes view the meeting via the smart boards in their classrooms. Thus, everyone is in on and on at the same time. During these community meetings, Mrs. McGrath and Mr. Moore encourage the students to virtually participate in musical and physical education movement activities. 
They've also included pre-recorded videos of students giving examples of being safe and responsible, part of our PBIS themes. It has turned into a wonderful community activity that includes both, as I said, hybrid and remote students. One of the bigger changes this year is the inability to run small group instruction, which was such a big part of our additional support services. This presented, of course, another challenge. To counter this, we moved our reading and math tutors to remote only so that they could run these additional Zoom classes with small groups of students in order to offer this additional academic support. And they've come up large in doing that. Additionally, the tutors have been instrumental in the building in helping to substitute for teachers in the classrooms, whether they are out or they are, are in a meeting. And these tutors have worked as a team to meet building needs while at the same time working as a team to minimize lost online instructional time. Finally, a big thank you to Linda Mills and Joanne LeBlanc who keep the schools, both Eveleth and Coffin, running on a day-to-day -day basis. There's no way our schools could be successful on a daily basis without their support and hard work. They truly are the heart of Coffin and Eveleth schools. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Sean. It's great to hear what's going on over there. All right, school committee, I will open it up to commendations. Does anybody have anything? I do not have any at this point. Sarah, you've got something? I do. Um, first of all, I, I've seen firsthand, I have uh, a first grader um, in Sean's building per se, because we're remote and, and they all, everyone's come together as a team. It's been wonderful, it's been a very positive experience. But I also want to give a shout out to the special education department because I've gotten a chance to speak to kind of see them try things in new ways and, um, you know, do some things remotely that they hadn't tried remotely prior. And I got to see that firsthand as a parent. And I've just been really impressed with how they've um, been willing to think outside of the box and, and to try new things. And, and I think that our students will only benefit from that. And so I just wanted to applaud them for further efforts. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I've got two. Um, one, I want to just thank Rich Kelleher again. Um, we, my boys have been taking advantage of his meals that he works, he and his staff work really hard on and um, they've, they're they always enjoyable and, and it's a great program. So if anybody hasn't checked it out, I would recommend that they do. And then I just wanna take a quick shout out once again to the teachers because it's parent teacher conferences um, I think last night as well as today. And um, they've just done the, an amazing job at kind of figuring out how to really connect with parents. And, and you know, they just, they clearly, in spite of all of the hurdles that they faced this year, really understand the kids just as well, if not better, honestly, than any other normal year that they've really taken the time to, um, to just, to, you know, figure out how each of them are ticking and, and what they need in all of these uh, difficult experiences they're having. So just one more, one more thanks teachers. All right, that will lead us, oh, John. Yeah, just jump in with one. I just wanna give a shout out to Dr. Eric Oxford <laughs> that some of you know, Mr. Eric Oxford, our special services director, but he successfully defended his dissertation on Tuesday and became Dr. Eric Oxford. So I wanted to give Eric a shout out for that major accomplishment. Absolutely, congratulations, Dr. Oxford. Well done. That's fantastic. Thanks, John. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Dan Howells, that leads us up to you. Actually, two seconds, Dan, before you pipe in, I forgot to um, say, state who's on our call tonight. So for the school committee, it's Sarah Gold, Emily Barron, Sarah Fox, and David Harris that's with us tonight. Uh, Megan is not here. All right, Dan Howells, are you with us? Well, I think we may not have Dan with us tonight. So I will follow up with him and make sure we can get a report back on the 17th. Uh, so that brings us to public comment. If anybody has a public comment, they can go ahead and raise their hand. Otherwise we will move along. All right, I don't see anybody raising their hand. So that will bring us over to our minutes. Tonight we have one set of minutes for September 17th, 2020. Um, those were in our Dropbox. Did anybody have any additions or concerns before I ask for a motion? 
All right, so can I have a motion to approve the minutes from September 17th, 2020? So moved. David moved. Seconded. Sarah second. All right, all in favor, Sarah Gold, yes. Emily Barron? Yes. Sarah Fox? Yes. David Harris? Yes. All right, that passes four to zero. Did John right. pull everybody ahead so like, you know, we don't have to, we're moving through this so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Is that credible? We like bribed Dan Sarah? not to come tonight. We're like, we're <laughs> done. No, my Christmas tree fell over shortly before I left this meeting. So I'm just kind of in an all business type mood. So, <laughs> um, all right. So that moves us on to an acceptance of a bench donation. Um, David, I know we had a, um, a memo and David, I think you have a little bit more info to fill the committee in on. Right. I, I do. And, and have some, you know, personal memories of, um, Mr. Till as well, having uh, been involved with youth football and then with my son who actually um, played football with with Ryan Dumay, which was um, his grandson. <clears throat> and so um, Dave reached out to me after he had passed away and Bob Till is his father-in-law. And as we've seen, there are some locations around town, Crocker Park, um, some of the upper upper bleacher areas where there's memorial benches. And so um, David said that the family would like to purchase and donate a bench to Marblehead High School for placement at Piper Field. He was a member of the Marblehead Gridiron Club since its formation, and he was a volunteer on the sideline uh, chain gang, as it's known for over 50, 50 years supporting Marblehead High School football. Uh, Derek Northcross and Park and Rec have agreed to help with the installation. So, um, yeah, Bob was there. Whether whether we needed people to handle the, the down markers for freshman games or junior varsity games or or varsity games, you name it, he, he was here and, and on the sidelines. And if he wasn't handling the change, he was certainly a spectator. And, and Dan even commented that... Um, you know, he knew Bob from his days when he was back at Beverly. So I think it's uh, certainly appropriate. And as well, uh, Derek Dumay also played football. His other grandson uh, played football here for four years. He went on to UMass. So I think it would be a real appropriate memorial for their grandfather to, to have that bench uh, placed at Piper Field. Great. Great. Thanks for that. Backstory, David. Um, can I get a motion to approve the acceptance of the donation of a bench in memory of Mr. <clears throat> Bob Till from his family for placement at Piper Field? So moved. I'll let David do the first on that. Sarah, you want the second? Sure. All right. All right. Well, um, thank you to the to the DeMay and the Till family for sure. That's a fantastic yeah. piece of I Legacy. I have one quick question. Um, I I think this is a great thing and a great idea. Um, I had heard at one point that there was a moratorium on on things like the donated benches and stuff. It came up um, when I was on the Bell School Advisory and, and someone had wanted to donate something. I didn't know if that was site specific or if there's any type of policy things like we need to tweak moving forward. So we looked over the policy on this and it doesn't seem like it uh, it precludes anything. Those policies are on our list to, to go over as well. So I think um, it didn't make it on to the one for this to coming Tuesday, but we'll look at that one for sure um, in January and just make sure and tidy anything up um, so that nothing can stand in the way. Yeah. And I think to your point, Sarah, with the, with the new school, there might be an opportunity for placement of various things that, that could come forward in the next several months. Um, whether it's, um, you know, some like some of the artwork that you see at the high school that could be accepted as a donation, not necessarily as a memorial, but, um, or if, as we know, there were some benches at the old Bell School that we tried to, that we tried to recoup. So, um, yeah, it's, it's worth looking at. Yeah, for sure. Yep. 
All right, any other questions on that? Okay, uh, I will call for a roll call. Sarah Gold, yes. Emily Barron? Yes. Sarah Fox? Yes. David Harris? Yes. All right, that passes four to zero. Thanks everyone. That leads us to John's updates. John, you've got a few updates for us this I, evening. I do. Um, I'll just start because I've written the weekly update and in the weekly update, I've said, as I said at school committee last night, so I wanna make sure that I actually <laughs> say the things that I said I said at school committee. Um, in any given year, December is a hard month. The holidays raise emotions and in a pandemic year or emotions are high, anxiety is high, fear is high, frustration is high. And for each person that's real, people that want more in-person instruction, their frustration is high because they're listening to uh, experts talk about in-school transmission rates and the governor's push for more in-person. People that are fearful of, the, uh, of COVID and transmission are worried that we're continuing with in-person instruction. And as I've said throughout this, everyone is right. It's very real and December's a hard month in, in a given year. And I would just ask that we all continue to lean into this work and realize that people are doing the best that they can and working harder than they've ever worked. I, I appreciate your shout out to the teachers. Sarah, I feel like we're in a groove, we're working together, um, but we all need to do our part. And so when you travel out of state, you have to abide those quarantine. And again, things change, but children coming to school and saying, I was away. And for years, parents have sent sick children to school. Uh, kids will come in and I say out of the mouths of babes, you know, they'll say, I threw up this morning, but mom told me to come to school anyway. Or I was running a fever, but dad gave me a couple Tylenol and said, uh, I have a meeting in Boston today, so you need to go to school. It's different now. And we don't, we each have to play our part or take a role in this and work together. And so it is really an awkward place for our educators to have a student in class say, I went to Vermont last weekend, or I went to DC to visit somebody and not abide those quarantines. And then teachers feeling like they have to report families and then families giving schools grief for enforcing things. I really just ask that we come together and recognize that this is tough for everyone and we're all working hard to do the right thing. So that's kind of my philosophical update. <laughs> um, I think it was Megan who had asked, rather than when my goals were due, giving you a laundry list of things that have happened since September. So what I did was try to put a running progress indicator to date and I sent that out uh, to the committee um, for each of my goals and I'll just briefly go over it. Uh, the new superintendent induction program, I continue to go uh, to the monthly meetings. Uh, the coach, uh, Chris McGrath, comes to our leadership meetings and she does coaching sessions with me. Um, I've done 25 plus entry meetings. I'm moving over to the town side of that and then doing the data uh, collection and document review where I look uh, at AP scores and SAT and ACT and MCAS and all of that. So that work continues uh, in earnest and they'll be going well. Budget, uh, I meet weekly uh, with Michelle, who is just absolutely phenomenal. I really value what Michelle brings uh, to the district. Um, monthly meetings, I list as with Jason Silva, but I don't think that there's a week goes by that Jason and I weren't, uh, are not in contact. And I really value that relationship as well. I know that during the interview process, that was an important component that the town and the school relationship is forged yeah. and I really value the work uh, that Jason has done to collaborate with me and to make that transition smooth. Um, I've been meeting with Ben Berman, uh, chair of the finance committee, which I find invaluable for historical perspective and uh, 
in terms of the budget. Working on capital requests, um, I believe that information has been submitted and I know the facilities committee that Sarah uh, led, they're looking at a capital review. So that will be uh, helpful as we budget plan. Uh, Michelle and I are gonna meet with each principal and director to sit down and go over some historical information and to have them look at their buildings or their programs and see uh, what they need to really make those run optimally. Um, we put together a budget calendar, talk about collective bargaining. I don't wanna steal Jason's thunder. He's gonna give you an update a little later on that. Uh, and then using data to inform the decision, looking back over trend data. And so I did uh, an enrollment for the last 10 years, and I'm gonna share that with the committee uh, at our next meeting. I think you'll find that very interesting, the demographic shift in the district and the enrollment shift over the last 10 years. Uh, the leadership team goal for professional practice, we had our retreat in July, we have weekly meetings, we're doing a book study, Lead Like a Pirate, uh, Shelley Burgess, I thank Nan uh, Murphy for helping us lead the leadership team through that. Uh, we've been working on some case studies together and we hired a new tech director, uh, which will be coming later uh, in my update. What was the name of that book again? Lead like, Lead like a pirate. Lead like a pirate. <laughs> yeah. <got it. laughs> um, the evaluation goal, we launched TeachPoint, which has been super helpful. So uh, Nan and I have a view of the district on uh, who's uh, the evaluations that are being done, the goals being set. Administrators submitted their goals. Uh, so they're modeling this work for educators. Um, we're working on a walkthrough calendar. I was at VETS today. What it's just so great to get out of Widger Road. Not that I don't like Widger Road, but there's so much great stuff happening in the buildings. And I got to spend some time with the seventh grade uh, team today. So that was great seeing science and Spanish and Latin and uh, math. So really good stuff. Um, and then we're doing some review of evaluation data and trying to come together as a leadership team or what high quality instruction, <clears throat> excuse me, high quality instruction looks like and coming to a consensus on that so that I'm not walking into a classroom and saying, oh, that's wonderful. And then somebody else saying, no, I don't think that. So we're gonna be doing some case studies around that. And then the final goal, the district improvement is uh, equity and Marblehead has really taken a lead. Um, I've been part of an equity work group that has been meeting for the last couple of weeks. Tomorrow, METGO is running a uh, equity uh, retreat, which will go from eight to one. I'm actually presenting uh, in one of the sessions. So um, we are going to be offering some pilot programs for METGO uh, in January for Educator PD and doing an equity audit across the district. So there's some uh, great stuff uh, happening there. We just hired a bilingual BCBA today so the commitment to uh, our equity work, um, I feel really good about our progress to date on that. So that's kind of the superintendent's goal update. Um, I do want to introduce our new director uh, of technology, Stephen Quietek, who has been at Manchester Essex uh, for the last 20 uh, plus years uh, as their network uh, administrator he was able to spend a half day in the district yesterday with Kathy and the technology team. He'll be back next Tuesday uh, to do another uh, half day or day in the district. Um, there's genuine enthusiasm about Stephen and everyone that has met him is really uh, enthusiastic about the perspective that he's bringing to the district. So I'll just kind of dish to Stephen uh, for maybe a 30 second uh, introduction, bio, and welcome to the district. So Stephen, take it away. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm very excited to join the Marblehead School District and uh, look forward to becoming part of the community. Uh, as John said, I've been with Manchester Essex for a little over 20, almost 22 years now. Um, I have enjoyed my time there, been able to help them grow with their technology. And uh, I see a lot of great things from Marblehead and look forward to helping to bring Marblehead to the next level for uh, their technology needs and working with 
each of the principals to get their individual schools where they need it to be and where they want it to be. Great. Well, welcome, Stephen, and uh, great two wonderful things that Stephen is bringing. He's been part of two building projects, uh, which is very timely for us, David, for him coming on board where we're at in the building project. And he uh, is very familiar with Aspen, which is our student information management uh, system. So um, we're looking forward to uh, Stephen uh, joining the leadership team officially on December 14th. And so I wanna thank everybody that was part of that search. And certainly this time of year, uh, conducting an expedited search as we did, uh, we're very, very fortunate uh, in the end result. So if, if I could, Steve, welcome, David Harris. Um, and um, I'm on the building committee. So glad to have you on board. And there, I did see an email from yesterday where Dr. Markey had sent out an introduction so that I can try and uh, Ramp, ramp you up with the project and put you in touch and it's, it's perfect timing. You know, we're starting to make even the decisions about whether we're gonna go with the whiteboard or the touch screens. And I, and I understand you even took the time to uh, participate in a recent meeting on that discussion. Um, not on buying the technology, but as you know, how we're gonna wire each classroom. So um, perfect timing. So I'll be uh, reaching out to you in the, in the coming weeks and get you in touch with the people and um, as we start moving forward and, you know, look for uh, purchasing with the FF&E and everything that's going on. And then the second piece is, I understand you're a Beverly resident, so are you going to be able to provide any insight on how we might be able to beat Beverly in football? This year? <laughs> can you can you be like an inside scout, maybe? Well, or you know, Be Beverly has always had a hard time beating Marblehead. <laughs> uh, my son uh, was supposed to be on the freshman team this year, so we're still hopeful that uh, eventually they'll be able to have a, a game. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it's it's already tough to beat you, so I don't know if I can give you any insights. Inside help there. Okay. Yeah. We're getting very heavy on our, our Beverly administrators here. I was just thinking that. It's like all, <laughs> more than half, I think, are, are have been stolen somehow from Beverly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Welcome, Stephen. It's very, very nice to have you here. Would you pronounce your last name for me? I tend to butcher names. I apologize. Sure, it's Quiet Tech. Okay, perfect. Quiet. And welcome. Thank you. Yes, welcome, Stephen. We're very excited to have you. Thank you very much. And superintendent's license, anytime the listserv is hot on a topic, I want to bring it uh, to school committee and learn through the fall athletics um, conversations. Today, the listserv was on fire with what districts are doing in terms of winter sports. And are they doing swimming? Are they doing basketball? Do they have ice hockey? Do they have, and it is a mixed bag. And I would just like to say that I, I want to commend A.D. Seglarski because he called together Mr. Bauer and I and Andrew Petty to talk about winter sports and how we could offer them given the MIAA guidelines and how we could entertain the idea of having spectators if that is something. So those conversations are ongoing. I don't have anything to report out uh, tonight, but we are moving forward uh, with conversations about winter sports. Again, I think it is in line with kind of my philosophical overview to start. Um, Swampscott, I know, is having their conversation tonight about winter sports. Mm -hmm. So it's all going to depend on what districts decide and what the league decides in terms of will there be enough to uh, build a schedule and to have a season. Mm -hmm. But our decision at this point is moving forward with winter sports uh, that we offer here and then working with the league to be able to uh, be able to schedule games. Great. So sports are supposed, or practices are scheduled to start December 14th. 14th right. okay. And then interscholastic play would start when we return from the holiday break, January 9th. Okay. John, do you have, or did Greg give you any sense of what they're talking about at the league level? If, if there's going to be teams to play, if, you know, kind of where that discussion is going? It 
he's not given me any update in terms of the league, but I do believe they have a meeting tomorrow, it might be. So um, I can update the committee uh, in terms of an email if, if, if and when Greg gets me that information. Great. Well, I think Greg did a great job with the coaches of keeping everyone very safe this, uh, over the fall. So yeah. I have no doubt that he's working in the same direction. Yeah. And that's all. All right. Great. Thank if you I, very much. Yeah. If, if I could just just for a minute, go go back to the goals. I just OK, I yeah. just had, sure. I just had one of one, one or two questions. So um, if you could just expand for a couple of minutes on how it's been working with your coach. I know that was one of the, um, you know, the Massachusetts Association of uh, and they have school superintendents um, brings that to us as an opportunity. And I know we have an excellent coach yep. that's working with you uh, and, you know, has COVID like impacted your ability to work with the coach or how, how is that? Can you talk about that a little bit, John? It's wonderful. Uh, Chris McGrath is in touch weekly. She uh, is also the coach for the Linfield superintendent, Kristen Vogel. And so we did a, a group meeting uh, two weeks ago in Linfield. Um, she uh, comes to our leadership team meetings and then she provides cool. feedback. So my guess is she might even be on the call tonight. <laughs> and then two hours after this meeting ends, I will get a narrative about <laughs> what I said, how I did it, things to consider for moving forward. It's been really helpful. And then there are three new superintendent meetings every month. And those are on different topics like difficult conversations, budget, um, uh, personnel, uh, high quality instruction, uh, goals, uh, vision, mission. So uh, all new superintendents across the state get together three times a month for oh, wow. uh, six hours. So two hours each session. Wow, that's great to be able to do that. So a lot of peers, a lot of, have you found any people that, you know, you're picking up the phone, obviously people that you knew coming into this job or? There are three of us that were high school principals. Yeah and we were in the state association together and we call ourselves the freshman class of 23 <laughs> that's when our contracts will expire <laughs> our initial contracts will expire and we uh, are in regular contact and, and i think that's something that i find very comforting about these turbulent times is we're not alone and the questions and the concerns and the problems that come up I can reach out to the superintendent in the neighboring district or two neighboring districts or three neighboring districts um, and say, what are you guys doing? And so like Gloucester has a new superintendent and Linfield has a new superintendent and uh, I think Peabody has a new superintendent. So there's really a camaraderie of people um, in this work, new to this work, um, yeah. navigating these really tough times. Yeah. So do you work with Ben and Kristen often, or is it just through these meetings? Um, no, I, I can pick up the phone and uh, Kristen and I, uh, she came here about a month ago to spend the afternoon in the district. And then I went down to Linfield uh, to spend time. And it's just helpful to kind of bounce ideas and to uh, have somebody that you're connected with um, that you can kind of process things through. And I would say there's probably a half dozen of those that I feel comfortable enough to drop an email or pick up the phone and send a text. Great. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I had a question on your goals too, that digging in, I don't know if it's under your goals or a superintendent update in that area, but um, the math curriculum was was due to be one of the things we looked at, but we kind of, with everything COVID and everything exploding that that did, we didn't get to have that working group up and running for the summer. Well, do you foresee us having that identified um, and at least having ballpark figures to go with that moving into budget season in the next month? Nan and I talk about that regularly. I see her smiling on the other end because I think today we were having that conversation that um, when we first came in in July, that was... Uh, one of the first topics that people uh, were talking about was the uh, work group for the new math curriculum. And it has not fallen 
uh, off the radar, and I'm confident that NAN and working with the building leaders uh, will be able to have some information on that, particularly as it pertains to the budget. Perfect. Very good. Great. All right. Anything else? Okay. Then I will move us along to our schedule of bills. We had a schedule with all of the invoices and everything in our Dropbox. So can I get a motion to approve the identified schedule of bills totaling $2,394,070.10? So moved. Sarah moved. Emily second. All right, did anybody have any questions on that? I just wanna put out there that, I, I, David's mentioned this before, every once in a while we get like a big schedule of bills it's because the building committee stuff comes through us and it's not that all of a sudden we went you know hog wild um, that's what it is for anybody that pays attention to that you know monthly number or bi-weekly number yep thanks sarah all right uh roll call votes sarah gold yes emily Barron. yes sarah fox yes and david harris yes all right, that passes four to zero. All right, so that brings us along to um, our discussion items. So we have with us tonight, uh, Jason Silva, and he is coming to talk with us about two things. Um, first will be the collective bargaining process. And then um, I asked him if you guys remember correctly, a couple of weeks back, we were a couple of meetings back, I guess, the, um, Mr. Gessner had sent us a letter and we had talked about different properties and so I had mentioned at that point that Jason and I had had a conversation regarding different things going on in the town side and some interest. So Jason's here to fill us in a little bit more in depth on that. So Jason, I will just ask you to unmute yourself and you can join our meeting. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. How's everyone doing? Great, thanks, Great. how are Welcome, you? Welcome, Jason. I'm good, I'm sorry my video's not working. My, my computer is not cooperating. Um, <laughs> So before I start, I just want to give a proper Beverly Panther uh, welcome <laughs> to Mr. Mr. Quietek, uh, Orange and Black Attack, Panther Pride, baby. Um, <laughs> so um, no, th <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me um, to the meeting tonight, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I have two quick things. I, I don't want to take too much of your time, um, but I do want to take a quick moment to, to review the first thing will be, I think, quicker than the second. Um, so I'm here essentially to notify you, um, the, the committee, that the Board of Selectmen has um, authorized me to negotiate um, uh, in collective bargaining activities on their behalf and to represent them. So, um, you know, we, as um, I think Dr. Bucky mentioned, but maybe not, we had a we had a meeting together with our respective labor councils uh, a couple of weeks ago to kind of start the conversation and start the strategy. Um, um, I look forward to working with uh, the committee and um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if the committee has appointed a, a subcommittee for that purpose yet, but I, it, okay. So I, I'm looking forward to working with all of you as a, uh, as you all know, this year is a unique year and will be a um, you know, unique process, I, I suspect, but I'm looking forward um, to partnering with you on that. Um, the second, if, if there's any questions or comments or anything like that, just you can feel free to interrupt. The um, second topic up here to speak about is um, there are several planning efforts underway in town that um, always end up um, with discussions around and about school owned properties. So given the number of efforts that are happening and the number of projects that are being considered um, and also the recent communication that we received from Mr. Gessner, um, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that um, the uh, Chairman Gold uh, invited me to speak to this. So there are really three major um, efforts that I'd say in some way, shape or form have, um, 
have involved school owned property. And I'm just gonna breeze through them. Um, I'll start though with a separate item, um, which is the Gary, the Gary School. So as you all remember, um, was it last town meeting? Time flies when you're having fun, but the, um, the school committee declared that uh, surplus and transferred the property, uh, voted to transfer that property over to the town and board of selectmen, town meeting voted on it. I thought that process was, um, I don't know how closely you followed it, but the town formed a reuse committee with members um, with planning expertise, historic preservation expertise. We hired a consultant to help facilitate. I thought that process worked really well. And ultimately now we have a project for eight condo units that is in front of the Old and Historic District Com Committee. And um, there's a hearing scheduled um, uh, this month to review the proposal and, um, and hopefully act on the proposal. Um, in, in keeping with that process, there's a, there's a few other things happening. So the first thing is um, the town last year, but final actually completed this year, a housing production plan. The housing production plan um, also had a committee of stakeholders and was uh, was facilitated by the uh, with help from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. The um, the plan includes kind of a um, assessment of current housing conditions, an inventory of our housing assets, and then makes a um, a whole host. I think there's 26 total of recommendations that um, we can do to help with access and affordability of housing in town. And they range, there's a broad spectrum of, of recommendations from regulatory changes to uh, zoning bylaw potential changes, programmatic, um, and also identifies potential development opportunities. So when you think about potential development opportunities, it won't be surprising to you that some school properties were identified as being potential um, development opportunities. So places like uh, the Coffin School, uh, the Evola School, um, and I think even Beacon and Green Street um, were um, referenced in the, in the plan. One of the recommendations in that plan was to form a housing production plan implementation committee so that it's a plan that doesn't sit on the shelf but actually is a document that is meaningful and um, those recommendations are acted upon. So the Board of Selectmen created the implementation committee and now we're in communication with MAPC um, again to help with some technical expertise and facilitation. One of the sites that um, we've talked about doing a planning exercise, and really that's all it is at this point, is at the Coffin site. Um, to look at the Coffin site and see what um, could be potential, um, potential development options, and, um, but with a focus on housing. This would be a housing production plan process with a focus on housing. Um, this doesn't bind us to anything. It would be, you know, it would be just a planning exercise so we could um, get a sense of that. I envision that process to be an inclusive one with, um, with school committee involvement, school department involvement to the extent that's of interest um, and involvement from stakeholders and neighbors as well, uh, similar to the process we undertook with the Gary School the next, um, the next effort that's underway is you may know we, the town received a gift of a little over $2 million that was um, from the Lars Anderson Trust. And the gift, um, one of the conditions was, it, it was, um, there was a expressed preference for winter sports support to use that funding source for, to support winter sports. And um, so there's a lot of people excited about that, especially youth hockey, um, but a lot of others, the park and rec and the board of selectmen are obviously 
uh, it's of great interest to them as well. And so the selectmen with the Rec and Park Commission created an ice rink committee. That committee is also working with a, um, a consultant who has expertise in constructing and developing and designing ice rinks. And so we've been meeting over the last probably four to six months on um, first potential types of rinks. Do we want a fully enclosed rink? What kind of facility do we want? Do we want an outdoor rink? And what sites in town could potentially support that use? Once again, um, school properties have been identified as potential sites that could potentially support that kind of use, mainly at um, Eveleth School and at Beacon and Green Street, although there are challenges there with, um, with uh, site conditions. And um, as probably many of you know, a good portion of that site is wet as well. So there are permitting -ish challenges and issues with that too. But just from a, a size perspective, it could accommodate it. Um, so that's happening. That's an ongoing process that's still happening. Um, there is planned, um, while it's been an open and public process, there is planned proactive outreach with, with um, stakeholder group um, meetings, separate meetings, and um, that would include neighborhood discussions. The last uh, project that I'll talk about, sorry, I'm going on way longer than I thought, would be is the archive facility, which I think everyone is aware of. So the archive facility, um, there's a committee that was formed uh, prior to me starting and they've identified the uh, basement of the Mary Alley building as the most suitable um, location for a facility like that. They were lined up from a timing perspective, just so you know, they were lined up in thinking that they would go to town meeting this year, but because um, everything is, kind of been delayed a year. They're um, pushed out. I think the library is going, planning to go this year to town meeting. And then the following year, I believe the archive facility is, is um, a, going to attempt to do that. Um, so um, while that's not school property, so to speak, it certainly has impacts on the school department, school committee. And so, um, so you know, there, there was talk uh, when um, Superintendent McCaldiff was here and um, about potentially using the Ever the School for that, um, for, um, for administrative offices. Um, but frankly, I think that's still a discussion that needs to be had between, um, between us. So, um, so those are the three major things that are happening right now. They, mm -hmm. they involve school properties, um, to an extent that I wanted to make sure that everyone was briefed on it. I will, I intend to follow up with all of you with uh, some backup materials. So you have, they're too long to, um, to go through right now, but at your leisure, I'll, I'll send that information to you in an email and um, you can look through it. And if there's any other follow-up questions based on that material too, um, as always, I'm happy to talk, so. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jason. Um, does anybody have any questions? Sarah? Of course. Um, so do you have a rough idea of timeline in any of this? Because I think the earliest we would be ready to go to town meeting with either Coffin or Eveleth is um, town meeting of 22. So I don't know if that's too much of a halt on any of these projects. So, Madam Chair, I, so um, Ms. Fox, I think that the, the timeline is very um, fluid, I would say, in a lot of this. I would also, I, I should have stressed beforehand, but I, I do want to stress that I say all of what I, what, what I went through with the full understanding that um, there's likely a, a, a conversation and process that the school department and school committee need to go through to uh, measure their needs and um, wants and how they, how you wanna go about um, 
potentially looking at those properties. So I want to make that clear that I, you know, we fully understand that um, that's the priority in all of this. And if it so happens that these become available, um, there are planning exercises in in the works that um, that we could take advantage of. So, you know, especially um, Sarah for the for the ice rink uh, project in the housing project. I think that those are um, that those timelines aren't set in stone by 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 a lot. So there's this flexibility. And we have some time at Widger Road too before we're kind of edged a little bit out out because <laughs> just for our planning purposes of where we go and when. Yeah, I you know since the pandemic we haven't really we haven't met since that. And there were, I think there were a few months even before that, that we haven't, but, but certainly because of the pandemic, the timelines have been affected. So I'd want to talk to that group before I gave a definitive answer on that. But I think, um, I think right now they, they're hoping um, if all goes as planned that the archive facility will be at town meeting in 22. Um, and then the timeline will be determined following that. Okay. No, I, I, I think it's good. Uh, thanks, Jason, for the update. But to, to get ahead of it, because even if you think about it, if, you, if let's say a property became available in 22, then you would spend the next two years studying what to do with the property potentially. And now, now you're that. So if you start now... <clears throat> and try and consider what some of the options might be in, a, in advance, then the town isn't left with, you know, a shuttered property that they need to be concerned about either um, maintaining or the safety of the property and, and everything else. So, yeah, I think it's, it's always uh, good timing. And I think, as you know, the finance committee has always wanted to look at what assets the town owns and how they could be put to, to, uh, you know, to better use. And certainly you've described two or three different options that are out there among many that, um, you know, green open space and park and recreation space is, is certainly another option, I think, to be considered when it comes to how we want to use the properties. And um, yeah, it's, it's good to uh, get out in front of it. Jason, isn't there a, a when we were doing the feasibility study, isn't there a sliver of property that comes down um, behind the water tower um, towards the, the Green Street athletic field that is somehow uh, deemed to be school property? I think, are you talking about the sliver between um, Tioga Way and Lincoln Ave? Correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah there is. There's a, we actually looked at that um, for the... Okay. Uh, yeah, we, we looked at that property for the ice rink and it was just, it didn't work for that use, but there is a sliver that the, that the school, um, schools own between Tioga and Lincoln Ave. Yeah. It, right. it does some great issues and it's not the best site, but yes. Right. Yeah. I, I wonder if we shouldn't look at that site or just have a discussion at some point about that site and Beacon Street, because from what we got out of the feasibility study, Beacon Street, for the purposes of the schools, in the, what we would need is not buildable. Um, it may be buildable for a smaller building or for another use or conservation land, but for our purposes, it, it doesn't provide anything that we could use outside of unless we want to do some type of outdoor classroom project type of thing. Um, but I think that if we have that conversation, that might be something that we put a placeholder on the warrant for um, this year, because we already know we can't build on those. Like I said, short of an outdoor classroom, those aren't buildable for the schools. Yeah, I think I think our next step is probably forming some type of um, advisory mm -hmm. committee type type setup so that we can really get a better grip on where our needs are going. You know, where what properties are you know, on the list and, and just kind of have a handle on that so that we can then start to work with the town on, on these types of things. Yeah, I would agree. Mm -hmm. 
All right. I'd be interested in, in being on that if we move forward with that at some point. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. All right, Jason, thank you very much. Um, always good to have you here. We appreciate you joining us and giving us all this info. Well, thank you for having me. And um, I always appreciate the school committees and um, the superintendents and the school department's partnership and um, um, in support. So I uh, look forward to working with you on this and many, many other things, hopefully. Thanks. Absolutely. We feel the same way. Thanks, Jason. All right, so that leads us to the subcommittee and liaisons updates. So I think we had a really full subcommittee update last time. And as I was talking with Lisa and planning this meeting, um, it seems as though all of our subcommittees are basically meeting the second week of the month. So that would put them sort of as we move forward, all kind of being updated at the same time. So we'll just have to take a look at that and maybe hold back on some just so that we can have a really full conversation around things that are going on and not feel, you know, this meeting is, is going pretty quickly, but some of the others don't. So just to make sure that there's plenty of time, but um, I'll work to get a better organizational handle on that. Um, but I left it on here because I just was wondering if there was any um, liaison updates that anybody wanted to give. Anything, Metco? All right. All right, then that will bring us along to the building project update. I think David, you, you had given me a something to share. I did. Um, <clears throat> read right. PowerPoint. Oh, nice. Now let's see if I can get it to. All right, there you go. Tell me when you want me to change the screen. Okay, so thanks for the opportunity. So, um, just wanted to uh, thank Brian Johnson from Left Field, who is our OPM representative that's on site every day um, for providing some of these photos so that I could give an update to everybody. These um, are current as of Tuesday, so maybe a few things have changed, but it's pretty much the layout as of Tuesday. So. Um, I'll start right here. Uh, this is, you know, what you'd be looking at is if where the where the entryway, the main entryway, would be to the school. Um, to the right is the would be the entryway to the cafetorium and, and the gymnasium. So you can see the progress that's going on there as they're getting ready to uh, lay the brick and um, window installation. Um, we've had one truckload of windows that arrived on Monday. Um, another set of windows were scheduled to arrive today. So windows will be going in <clears throat> shortly. And, um, you know, we should start to see the progression there with, with the windows as well. So, um, okay. next slide. Uh, this is a, a second floor classroom um, looking out towards uh, Dartmouth Road. And one of the things that's interesting about the classrooms that we learned on Wednesday um, they will be doing a mock-up of an individual classroom, at least from the perspective of, you know, the layout for, um, you know, the wiring, the windows, the doors. And so they'll have, so then as they move to each of the other rooms, the contractors will know uh, exactly how they want it to be. And they'll do a similar mock-up once they get to, uh, you know, the interiors and, and FF and E, so that's a second floor classroom, which will either be second or third grade. This is the uh, second floor hallway, and for those of you who were there, I think you were there, Dr. Bucky, and um, Emily, you were there, you know, the, the partitions weren't up, and we could certainly see, looking down into the, the first floor, and now you kind of get a feel for, you know, the extended classrooms and the placement of how that's going to start looking and um, you know, how the corridors will start, will start to come together. And it's certainly, you know, not your, not that we don't love Marblehead High School, but it's not your typical narrow hallway with lockers on, hmm. on each side of, of the hallway. It's gonna be um, really open and bright and um, really inviting. So that's exciting. Next slide. Um, so this is standing from the second floor. 
um, looking down into the cafetorium. And so where where most of those those frames are, door and window frames are laid, that's essentially the stage. And then beyond that is where, where the gymnasium would be. And to the left is where there would be another egress where students will be able to um, leave the cafeteria to go upstairs and go outside. And this is, um, besides being the elevator shaft on the back, this is the uh, Emily Barron Lighthouse, as I like to call it. <laughs> um, you can see it coming into coming into play, the, the uh, circular area at the bottom. And then when you see the boarded area at the top, they're still finalizing the procurement of the glass. That will be a you know simulated simulated lighthouse with a with a look as you drive into the school and then it will come down into the classroom and then you'll be able to you know look up as well and then this area from this area you'll be able to see um, <clears throat> down in down into the first floor um, there'll be some open benches for students and then on the opposite side of the elevator is where the media technology and library will be. So that's real exciting to see that coming together. And here we are, the, the uh, west, west elevation. So that's the area facing Dartmouth Road, facing Tower School, <clears throat> where the brick has started to go in. And um, moving right along with the brick, you know, ideally you want to have temperatures so you don't incur any delays or extra cost or additional heating that is between roughly 40 and 50 degrees. And we've been pretty lucky uh, tomorrow and this weekend might be a little bit of a struggle, but um, so far so good on schedule. Everything's everything's looking good with Lighthouse who's doing the brick laying and you'll see another picture here of, of brick. Um, yep, next one, after it's been washed. So, you know, after they lay the brick and do the mortar, um, you know, the brick gets washed and cleaned, and then it's prepped to uh, receive the window frames, the doors, each of the first floors. As we know the first floor classrooms all have exterior doors and the window frames. So that gives you a little close up look of what that's going to look like. Um, this is up on the roof. And um, so, as described here, the skylight has you know, temperature protection. They'll have temporary heating in the winter um, since the mechanicals will not be up and running. So um, Jason Gilliland and Marblehead Fire Department were on site earlier this week, um, reviewing the specifications of the temporary heat um, and all the safety requirements to have heat in there. So as seen here, they, they put this over, you know, to um, allow for some additional heating benefits until the, you know, the, the complete envelope and windows of the building building are in. And um, they're really getting ready to, they're get, actually getting ready to do some leak testing on the roof. So um, that's exciting too. So they, you know, that's one of the, one of the things you want to get done so that they can start working indoors. And this is a pretty busy site. It's hard to envision, but this is the playground and uh, multi-purpose field. The um, you know where we'll have the organic garden, which will be closest where they have some of the um, you know the concrete prep work going on is where the uh, outdoor organic garden will be located, and then along the building will be you know the basketball court and you know back where those crushed stones and piles are. But it's um, I don't think the picture does it justice for those of us who, who've been there. It's it'll be, you know, second to the veteran school. It'll probably be one of the biggest recreational play fields and um, outdoor educational spaces that we have in the district. And so that's pretty exciting. But it's been very beneficial to have this as a as a lay down area, as you can see, for <clears throat> the ongoing construction Just work. Just to give you people a scope who are used to being at Bell and knowing what we had previously, if you yeah. look in the far back corner, you can still see the swing set standing, that tiny, mm. tiny, tiny little structure. And yeah. it, yeah, it was that little area around there that the kids had 
to play. I mean, they, they had a blacktop area, but that that basically was it. So was to it. give you an idea of scope, what we're offering now versus what we had then, you can see what they had for you know swings. <laughs> That's a great, great point. It's a, it's a good point of reference that that swing set still there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next, next picture, time. almost done. And then, um, you know, this is a perspective from the roof looking back towards how the parking lot will be laid out. And, um, you know, just with the idea also that this, this school, I mean, we've talked about this and talked about this from a neighborhood perspective, taking cars off the street, um, having a place for visitors to park, having room for queuing, everything that's gone into the design. Once again, we're fortunate that this space and one of the reasons it was chosen ultimately is the final space. Um, second to the high school, um, there is no school that has, you know, a hundred off street parking spaces and the ability to uh, queue up traffic with you know, an entry area and an egress area. And one of the things that's that's nice about this is, so they, they did a, you know, what's, you know, the, the tempor temporary um, layer of asphalt. They took advantage of doing that in, in early fall, one, to make it convenient for the contractors to park there, and two, to keep, just keep the site cleaner. It's, it's cleaner for the neighborhood doesn't create dust, mud on the streets for trucks entering, coming and going. So, you know, it's called the binder coat. So when they put that binder coat down, um, it was uh, part of Gilbane's foresight to, to get that done. And as you can see along the back, that's where all the brick, the brick is received and delivered. So it's really helped keep the site clean and neat and organized as well. And I Great. think that might be so that image that we just hit up there too makes me think of when we when we were out you know doing the the tours to to pitch the school and the information tours if you will um katie martin and i always had this one line where we talked about how many parking spots there were on site versus what we had previously and she used to joke and give the example of the mom carrying the kid and pushing a stroller and the cupcakes for the party and all this juggling walking two blocks away that and will be for probably a decade um but th that parking lot the fact that we can put everybody on site to get to that school is life-changing for anybody <laughs> picking up their kids any faculty I, I, people in that neighborhood that no longer will have you know 80 moms parking in front of their driveway or, or dads parking in front of the driveway so that in and of itself is going to be life-changing yeah, it's exciting to see it all it coming is. along. It yeah. is. So uh, thanks again to our OPM. So the last little update is, so we have a building committee meeting on Monday to um, affirm what's called the GMP or what's known as the guaranteed maximum price. And at that point, the project will pretty much um, send a submittal into the Massachusetts School Building Authority affirming the guaranteed maximum price of the project. And as I sit here tonight, um, we've pretty much bought out um, 85 to 85% 85 of the project. The last piece, major piece to buy out is landscaping. So there'll be some ongoing discussions there. Um, and landscaping will be listed as an allowance, a few other things like um, window dressings and some other things that typically come towards, um, towards the end, end of the project. And the project is, um, as we sit here tonight, it's uh, on schedule and on budget. So very exciting. So I had one piece to add. Jean Raymond, the architect, called me later this afternoon to let me know that they've moved into the next stage um, as far as FF&E goes. And um, I'm going to be sending out an email in the next day or so to the people that were involved with looking at those interior pieces. But he's going to be working up some um, image boards for us to, they'll do some stuff in SketchUp, but then he'll get us some image boards um, and materials boards with actual, you know, this is the, the actual pieces of things that we'll be looking at. Um, so that will be exciting to see that piece get fleshed out and, and brought through the various um, levels of the committee. Great. Yeah, that's very exciting. Yeah, that's, that's good news, Sarah. I'm, I'm, glad he, I'm glad he reached out to that. We, we were wondering when 
he might be able to get back to you on that. So that's good to hear. He's ready to move on, on that and keep that moving forward. But um, And the woman from his office that's handling the lead certification also emailed me today, had two more questions for me. Um, and that seems to be moving along. Um, one of them had to do with the organic garden. So I put her in touch with Katie Martin and the other one um, has to do with some signage. So I'm going to touch base with Todd in the next few days, but that's the lead certifications moving right along too. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. That's good stuff. It's really good. Thanks, and thanks for those slides. Exciting now we just it. need to figure out, as I'll say again, what we're going to call the school. But yes. We can, well, we can get so to that after the new year. The, the policy <laughs> subcommittee is going to be looking at that policy at their at our uh, meeting on Tuesday, and then it will to make sure that that's all tightened up and everything, and then we will be able to move forward after the new year. We had a look at the um, the the deed and the circumstances in which the land was gifted to remember we were going to look yeah. at that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Writing that down probably for the third time. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks guys. Okay. So that leads us to closing business, um, new business. I will just take a second to note the MCAS resolution um, just with an oversight that it didn't make it onto this uh, agenda. So it'll definitely be there on the 17th. So I apologize, but I was a little glad when it didn't end up because mm -hmm. I didn't have a chance to talk with Nan yet. So <laughs> hopefully over the next two weeks, it'll be a little more calm and I can get in there to speak with her. Um, so I just wanted to note that. Um, I had two items. One, I talked briefly with John via I think email, but it may have been phone. It's been a long week. I apologize. Um, and he, it was one of those things that's been coming up in listservs, he said on his end. But um, I'm wondering if, Sarah, if you want to reach out to Dorothy and see kind of how school committees are handling the governor's order about the travel policy, uh, the, the travel policy, and if districts are coming up with a policy on how they're handling that. John really... Um, spoke to it perfectly you know these kids come in and they do their weekend news and they tell you all about where they've been and you know spill their guts and that kind of puts the schools in a really awkward position um when johnny says you know he was this and that and in these different places that we know require um you know the quarantine or the test Chris Stevens put a tweet up after our last meeting, how I, I said in school, per, uh, in-person education is a privilege. And I got a lot of flack for that. And I, and the point I was getting at is there is an order out from the governor and none of us are above the rules. Um, and so we have to make sure that we're not putting our educators in a really precarious situation of feeling like they're policing yet another thing here. Um, so I'm just wondering what school committees are doing to um in the way of policy making to to kind of clean this up um so that was one question and then i also was remiss in um when it came to accommodations not get, i wasn't paying attention to the timing of our next meeting i want to give a commendation to kathy hennessy who is retiring um especially this year with everything that has happened with our reliance on technology um i've I've been amazed at the hours she's put in at how she's, you know, she still had a positive attitude whenever I've had to reach out with a question for one of my kids. Um, I, I think she's been working 10 and 12 hour days pretty much since COVID started. So if any, and we, everyone deserves a break, but Kathy most certainly has earned her retirement and I wish her well in that and thank her for her service to the Marblehead public schools. And I just want to acknowledge her and, and thank her. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. I didn't, I, I didn't do my math on, on those dates either. So I appreciate that. All right. Anybody else have any new business? All right. I don't think there was any correspondence um, that, that we've got for tonight. So I will adjourn us at 815. I think that's a record. It is impressive. <laughs> See you on the 17th. See you on the 17th. All right. Thanks everyone. Yeah.